The Gulf Injustice Podcast, the official podcast of Detained in Dubai with Rada Stern. Hi, I'm Rada Sterling and welcome to today's edition of the Gulf Injustice Podcast. Now we're going to be talking again about Ras al Khaimah. It's an emirate uh, that, that just comes up again and again every time I think that there couldn't possibly be any more people with problems or issues with the ruler, Sheikh Saud, another one comes along. Um, for those of, of you who haven't been following, Sheikh Saud assumed power and uh, was concerned about his rival brother being a threat to him, and he decided to purge, a uh, political purge of all staff in all authority positions, that's uh, the Ras al Khaimah Investment Authority, the Free Trade Zone Authority, and when he did so, he didn't just fire these people or end their contracts and wish them well, he levied false allegations against each and every one. The ones that were in the country were arrested and uh, held without charge or charged and held indefinitely with life sentences for crimes they haven't committed. And those who were outside of the country were levied with uh, false Interpol red notices, which has led to their arrest. Uh, some, some people have been arrested, some people have been detained. One of them was detained uh, for over a year abroad, pro approximately a year before being released. And there's several litigations going on around the world. Now, this particular ruler is of great significance because of the belligerent acts that he is taking in ab abusing the Interpol Red Notice database for one repeatedly. And today we're going to be talking to Dr. Hatam Massad, who is the former CEO of Rakia. He brought in absolutely billions to the Emirates. And uh, you'd think Sheikh Saad would be very happy with his performance, but instead has decided to target him and try to steal his money from abroad. Now, this is something that Sheikh Saad has done repeatedly with others as well. He has felt that anyone that he wanted to purge should also give them uh, their money, even, even if it was earned you know, in, the, in their own right, in their own business, and had nothing to do with him. He had no right to that money whatsoever. But when you own the legal system and you can abuse Interpol, I mean, why not, it seems? Uh, so Sheikh Saad has a, a real, really terrible reputation. He's uh, been arrested in the United States and accused of sexual harassment, but he managed to uh, escape the country and he hasn't been back since. Um, but now we have several litigations going on. He has two people uh, detained in uh, Ras al Khaimah and he's using them to try and uh, get confessions or, you know, false, false forced confessions, basically, to uh, get evidence to use against people who are outside the country. But he's using his entire legal system uh, as his own personal courts. They don't need evidence. The, the trials last two minutes, enough time to type out a conviction. And then he's using those convictions to pursue people abroad through international courts. And that's in, in Bangladesh now, it's in Saudi, it's in uh, Georgia, and it's in the United Kingdom and the United States. So he's using this ridiculous kangaroo court system that doesn't require any evidence of wrongdoing to secure a judgment to then pursue people who he wasn't able to unlawfully detain. In Ras al Khaimah, he's using, using his own courts to get judgments to enforce overseas. And it's very important that countries realise that these UAE judgments can't be taken seriously. They shouldn't be enforced, neither on a criminal, an extradition, or on a civil basis when it comes to uh, attempts to seize assets. Because these judgments, they're, they're simply wrong. They're, they're a joke. They're a real joke. But anyway... Um, we have uh, two people in detention in Ras al-Khaimah. They have cases in the United Kingdom in the English High Court where they're suing for forced confessions for human rights violations and torture. And these very same confessions that were, were uh, given under torture are being used in court cases against people like Dr. Hatta Massad, who we're going to be speaking with again today. We also have Osama al -Amari. He's the former uh, CEO of the Free Trade Zone Authority there. He was on, uh, listed on Interpol. Uh, he's, he's already been published in the Washington uh, Times on, on that point. And he successfully uh, obtained a judgment against people involved in the persecution of him. Because not only does Sheikh Saad go after people legally and misuse the courts and misuse Interpol, try to have people detained and then try to get them to apologise for things they haven't done or to compensate him where he doesn't deserve compensation. 
but he also has made significant efforts on the public relations side to slander people's reputations. Anyone who had done a great job in, in Rasselhammer uh, before his accession to, to uh, power, he has slandered all over the internet, tried to at least ruin their reputations, and they've had to fight back because they haven't committed any crimes. They did nothing but bring in business to the Emirate, put it on the map. It was nothing before these people supported its growth, supported its establishment, including Dr. Hatta Massad, who was the forefront of this Emirate's development. Um, so Hatta Massad has been falsely accused of a variety of crimes. It keeps changing every day. And he was levied with several Interpol notices. It was something like four or five, and, and there's another one coming. And uh, they just use him as a, a method or mechanism to harass him, to keep him in a particular location. They don't want him being mobile. They don't want him to be able to defend himself against any of their allegations. So... Uh, he was actually arrested and detained in Saudi and held for several weeks, but they declined to extradite him to Ras al Khaimah despite their request. Why is that? Because there was no evidence. When Ras al Khaimah decided to pursue him in Saudi Arabia through the courts in Saudi, Saudi said, we will happily hear the case, but we're not going to accept a judgment from Ras al Khaimah. We have to hear the facts and determine the outcome for ourselves. So Ras al Khaimah withdrew the case. They didn't believe that they would be able to successfully prove that, um, that they had a claim against uh, Hatta Massad. And uh, Saudi threw out the case and said, OK, this, this is obviously just a, a politically motivated attempt to extradite someone. And they were hoping that the UAE and Saudi Arabia would be so friendly that they would just automatically send someone back to uh, the UAE without even looking at the case. Now, I, I never thought I would say he's lucky he was arrested in Saudi Arabia, but it seems they took the case seriously and they did want to hear it on its merits. So um, Dr. Massad was released at that point, but it doesn't stop uh, Russell Kamer going after him for that very same case that they refused to prove in Saudi, they actually took straight away back to their own courts, Sheikh Saad took it straight to the Ras al Khaimah courts and got an instant judgment. And he has used that judgment to pursue Dr. Massad's assets in other countries, in this case, Bangladesh, behind uh, Dr. Massad's back and without him being able to defend himself, without being informed, a judgment was entered against him in the state-owned courts, the Sheikh Saud-owned courts, and that judgment has been used to pursue his assets in Bangladesh. And they, they sought a, a judgment in absentia in Bangladesh to freeze his companies there, to freeze his assets and actually companies that he doesn't even have anything to do with. And the only reason he found out about that judgment was because the government of Bangladesh issued a press release about it. So, of course, that's now uh, being appealed because there's no way that Bangladesh or any other courtroom in the world, any other country, should be taking seriously the judgments coming from the UAE. And I'm sorry, I cannot say just rack because rack is just essentially a state, a part of the UAE. So if this, if these kind of judgments are allowed in the UAE, that's the whole country. So the UK should not be taking judgments seriously from the UAE, and nor should Bangladesh, and nor should any other country. If they do, they are rendering themselves uh, unsafe for foreign investment. If you've ever had any issues in the UAE or in another country in the Gulf, and, it, and, you, and you have a judgment against you in absentia, and that can be enforced against assets you hold abroad, you want to know that the legal system is going to hear the facts of the case, and they're not going to take these judgment, judgments at face value, which is what appeared to happen in Bangladesh. Now, we just can't have that. The other thing we can't have is a Swiss national, Hatta Massad, uh, being treated in this way without ramifications within Switzerland. So we've contacted uh, various parties. We've contacted the Swiss UAE Business Council. We've contacted the Swiss ambassador, uh, the consulate. We've, we've contacted the UAE ambassador to Switzerland as well, and all sorts of investment groups and business groups, because while this continues to happen, the UAE is unsafe. We cannot just say Ras al Khaimah. We have to say the whole UAE. But Abu Dhabi, 
hasn't done anything about this. And this is a, a terrible stain on the UAE's reputation, the fact that Sheikh Saud has been doing this against multiple parties for years and years and shows no signs of stopping, no signs of being uh, reined in by Abu Dhabi. Why is it okay for Abu Dhabi, the headquarter, essentially the capital of the UAE, why is it okay for them to let Sheikh Saud do whatever he wants against foreign nationals and expect that not to have an impact on the business community. They've just signed the Abraham Accord. They're inviting Israel investors. They're inviting more and more investors all the time. But what are they doing about Russell Hammer seriously damaging the reputation of the entire country? We have uh, major investors, millionaires. We have um, people who have helped the country, put them on the map. I mean, Hatam Masadi was all over, you know, he's a cover boy of many business magazines. He was at the forefront of development in the UAE. And then to have someone like him and Osama El Amari and the Free, Free Trade Zone Authority and a whole bunch of other prominent businessmen coming together to say the UAE is not safe. And it's not that this happened several years ago and, you know, things have changed and now it's more safe for Israelis or other foreign investors. Absolutely not. This is still going on every day. Sheikh Saad has had several Interpol notices already removed against Hassan Massad, but he continues to report new ones every day. Now, this is an unbelievable situation and Abu Dhabi absolutely needs to crack down on this rogue emirate that does not abide by the laws of the UAE. Now, uh, we'll pop over and we'll... Um, Talk more to Khatam Assad now. I'll let him explain to you a few things and how he feels about the investment situation in the UAE. And you can imagine he's not going to be recommending it. When did you start working with Sheikh Saud? Since 1989, actually. He had called me uh, to Ras al-Khaimah to make studies on minerals. And uh, we made a feasibility study for the ceramic factory. And uh, we have uh, uh, founded uh, this RAK Ceramics, RAK Ceramics. And in 15 years, it became number one in the world. Okay, so you were with RAK Ceramics and you were with RAK here as well, were you not? In 2003, Sheikh Saud has been appointed the crown prince of uh, Ras al Khaimah. He ha has appointed me as his advisor to represent him and to attract investments into Ras Al Khaimah. Actually, I have called some friends in the World Bank to make a conference, investment conference in Ras Al Khaimah to give it uh, really uh, something international and uh, uh, to be respected. It was a success, actually. Many investments came. Sheikh Saud was, uh, I think, very happy. And uh, he has created what we call today Ras Al Khaimah Investment Authority, Rakia. And he has appointed me CEO. He has uh, given me the title of CEO. And uh, he has given a, two, a piece of land in, uh, in the desert of Ras Al Khaimah of 2 million square meters initially. And uh, this uh, 2 million square meters to become a free zone, industrial zone. And uh, I made the master plan. There was no water, no electricity, no roads, nothing. I made the master plan and we, we have uh, started. The, I have appointed a team. Uh, by the way, Ras Al Khaimah Investment Authority did not have any capital uh, initially, nothing. And uh, I appointed a team to start promoting Ras Al Khaimah. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, we have been working with PricewaterhouseCoopers in India with the KPMG in, uh, in UK and around and many companies and the Financial Times and so on. And we made a lot of uh, seminars around the world in UK, in Germany, in France, in USA and in India to attract investments into Ras Al Khaimah. And uh, very soon this became a success. In 2012, this, uh, we had registered more than 10,000 companies registered in Rakia. That's a huge growth, really, with, with Rakia. It's amazing. In just a few years, he must have been uh, very happy with his development. He was uh, definitely very happy. And actually, in, uh, in two years, we have filled these two million square meters of land uh, to, uh, with industries. And uh, we leased the lands uh, for various investors. And uh, Sheikh Saud has uh, uh, given another piece of land in Al Ghail, which is more than 20 million square meters, also to develop it and there we have developed and uh, we have uh, 
made roads and infrastructure and this to attract more investors. And a lot of investors truly came to Al Ghail Industrial Zone also. In five years, we made 65,000 visas, which created 65,000 employments in this uh, industrial zones. So, um, I mean, how would you describe Sheikh Saud throughout the time? And you've known him a long time. And obviously before the incidents that we'll talk about later, you must have had a fairly close relationship with him. Well, I had excellent relationship with him and we were friends and I really uh, uh, considered him as a big friend and the only friend I had in UAE. And were you involved, you weren't involved in the arrest of him, a free trade zone authority, were you? That no, the free, the free trade zone, it was a different uh, zone actually. It was headed by Mr. Uh, he, the CEO was Mr. Osama al Omari, yes. and the chairman was Sheikh Faisal, the brother of Sheikh Saud. And did you have any dealings with Sheikh Faisal? No, I didn't have uh, dealings actually. I knew Sheikh Faisal, but I did not have really uh, relations uh, with him, no, personally. And um, when Sheikh Saud came into power, did you notice any changes or shifts? Well, uh, when, uh, when uh, Sheikh Saud uh, became the ruler in 2010, uh, he, uh, he wanted to appoint, he has appointed his son, Sheikh Mohammed, as a chairman of uh, the ceramic factory. And, uh, I had no, no issues with that. However, uh, after that, uh, somehow I was cited little by little. I don't know for which reason. I don't know what has started happening. Uh, somehow, probably because, uh, now I'm talking, uh, uh, probably because his brother, Sheikh Faisal, who was previously the crown prince, was doing a lot of lobbying against Sheikh Saud that he is investing overseas and so on. And Sheikh Saud suddenly in 2010, he wanted to sell all the investments overseas. So but he, unfortunately, he, he, we had... We, and he was losing a bit of influence in the Emirate. Were people, people getting upset at him for investing overseas? Or was he just responding uh, to his brother's lobbying campaign? Um, mostly, in my opinion, he wanted to respond to his brothers and to show that he, it is not true and so on. Uh, however, I mean, it is not an issue. Uh, every country is investing overseas and every businesses are investing overseas. Uh, Abu Dhabi has invested in India and many places and other countries also. So it, it doesn't matter. But I don't know. He suddenly he wanted to sell everything. And uh, from 2010 until 2012, I was only there to sell the properties or to try to sell the properties overseas. We have sold the uh, the port of Poti, we have uh, sold many things and uh, try to disinvest actually. So when, um, when you were dealing with Georgia, were you in contact with Jella McCartsey and the others who have uh, had their own issues? Yes, yes, actually Jella McCartsey was a lawyer and he, we have appointed him as, uh, and he met Sheikh Saud many times, of course, Sheikh Saud knows him very well. And uh, we had appointed him as the manager of the, uh, of the, investments in Georgia for Rakia. Yes, I met him. Do you know of the kind of dealings that Sheikh Saud had with the government of Georgia or his contacts in Georgia? Because during that time, uh, they, they said that they had uh, been held in prison and that he was trying to force them to sign confessions, which they never did, and incentivize them to sign confessions so that they would eventually be released from prison. And then that ended up in an arbitration, which is still ongoing. But did you know anything about that? Or? Well, I know, actually, uh, after uh, Zaza uh, Gela Mikazi was uh, out of jail, he told me that they have tried, especially the desert people, uh, tried to uh, force him to make allegations against me by telling him, well, if he make allegations that I am responsible, they will free him and everything. But actually, I was not responsible about anything no corruption whatsoever has taken place. And uh, during the period where I was uh, following the businesses of Rakia, and uh, that's why Zaza could not, I mean, Jail Amikadze could not uh, uh, say anything. He had nothing to say uh, yeah. against me. Exactly. And I, I suppose the other thing uh, that we should cover here is, so he wanted to pull out all of his investments and those projects weren't finished yet. So he wasn't going to make profit. It's like, if, if you buy stock, you can't pull out prematurely. You have to let it go to the point where you're going to withdraw it. So is that the problem here? Is this all 
did did he levy these campaigns against people to try and get money back simply because he was pulling out of the investment early and he just well uh, actually in uh, in georgia the investments were one shopping mall and the pieces of land where we're supposed to build golf courses and hotels and this and the port of Poti. I mean, Rakia had bought the port of Poti in 2006, 2007. And you know, in 2006, 2007, the whole world was booming. In fact, what, we, what I can say, we, we, they bought these properties at high prices when the market is high and uh, they were to be sold in 2010 when the whole world market was very dull. However, the port was sold with a profit, actually. But in my opinion, if they would have kept the investment for another two years, they could have developed the port and the port could have brought much more money than what it was sold for. What has happened also, in the same time, he had uh, uh, appointed uh, an accountant uh, called Jim Stewart in the uh, in, uh, investment office. And this accountant is... Uh, uh, his aim was to to right. sell and to uh, and especially uh, he did not want to have debts. He was thinking that any government who would have debts is a problem, as is a burden. And if tomorrow they cannot repay the debts, it's a problem. And so it was a kind of panic in the place, and that's why it it was to be sold immediately and to bring back the money and so on. I mean, what what happened? Obviously, there was a, a turn at one point and there was a turn against you and many, many others. And it seemed to all happen around about the same time. So what changed, Sheikh Sounds? Well, uh, what I heard uh, outside uh, afterwards and from the news, actually, uh, on the media, is that uh, Sheikh Saud believed that I'm a supporter of Sheikh Faisal. It seems Sheikh Faisal was to become the crown prince of Ras al Khaima after Sheikh Saud will become the ruler, and Sheikh Saud has appointed his son. I mean, it's his problem. I mean, his business is not mine. Uh, he um, or many people, or probably Sheikh Faisal, they would they would have thought that I am sided with Sheikh Faisal and I am politically against Sheikh Saud, where I have nothing, no political interest with so whatsoever in any country. So I have no reason to be uh, with the side of Sheikh Faisal or uh, or against Sheikh Faisal. So it, uh, this is the main reason, in my opinion. Other than that, I don't see what has happened. Also, I think he had an issue with his uh, brother Talib, uh, Sheikh Talib, who was a chief of the police. And uh, it seems Sheikh Talib was supposed to become the deputy ruler, and he was denied this. And uh, again, Sheikh, Faisal, uh, Sheikh Saud probably thought that I'm a friend of Sheikh Faisal, or of Sheikh Talib. I mean, uh, look, uh, I am friend with everybody, and I have no enemies, and I don't hate anybody. Uh, I was friend for 23 years, and in my opinion, a friend is a friend. Either you are a friend or you are not a friend. And I don't change my friendship. And actually, what pains me today most is that the friend became an enemy. This is a dramatic situation. I mean, that, that's quite paranoid in a sense, isn't it? And I know that he yeah. felt that way about other people as well who didn't have any allegiances to, you know, him particularly as a, as a politician, as a ruler, and they didn't have any allegiances to anyone else either. So it was more about people are there to do business, people are there to support growth, development, economic um, projects. And I agree with you. And actually, I was his biggest supporter from day one when he was crown prince. I was really working day and night, and I have been working from 2003 until 2012 without sparing any of my time to help Sheikh Saud to develop Ras al Khaimah and to do whatever he wanted and to execute all his orders and all his instructions and all of his wishes. And this is what I have done. And uh, all this, uh, it, was, uh, it was just purely for friendship because in Rakia, I was never, I never received any remuneration and uh, nothing. Uh, he appointed me CEO. He gave me full power of attorney, but I was, I did not have a contract. I did not have anything and I did not have even a salary. So no compensation whatsoever. Even in Alhamra village where I worked for 13 years from 1998 where we built first Alhamra Hotel and then Alhamra Village, which I was following, developing myself. And uh, I was never receiving any compensation as a board member. I mean, okay, so he obviously became very insecure at the time that he was being lobbied against. And he's taken advice potentially from other people who have named people in his 
uh, circle as potential risks. Was this uh, coming from his son, who had been named as the crown prince, or his? Successor? Well, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't know. But what is a pity? I think Sheikh Saud has left himself uh, uh, being. Uh, uh, taken advantage by all these uh, lawyers who, whose aim only is to make money. And I am sure they must have made a lot of money from him. And these people, they just accused, uh, accused anybody for nothing, for no reason. And uh, actually, Deshert uh, uh, met me. I met Neil Gerard and okay. David Hughes and J Jamie Buchanan. They wanted to meet me and in the meeting, uh, they, they never said anything. They were just talking politically. They just talking to demoralize me, to make me feel afraid, to make me feel uh, uh, guilty, to make me feel, uh, uh, the, you know, as uh, somebody who has uh, committed a crime or anything. But, but there is nothing. I told them, look, I'm, I'm sorry. If you have anything, if there is any problem in any project, I am willing to help and I'm willing to go anywhere to Georgia, to India, to any of the projects you have to help Sheikh Saud to solve, to sort out. No, no, we, we, you, you should know. Okay, what should I know? I don't know. I left the projects uh, since three, four years they have taken away from me. And now there are problems. After four, four years, they discovered there are problems. It cannot be. Or five years. And today we are in 2021. And I left in 2012. Why this should be? I could have done anything he wanted me to do as a friend. And I would never on earth make Sheikh Saud lose money. I mean, if you, you know, for instance, the project of Pioneer Cement, it was, uh, Rakia was 50% partner with an Indian investor in Ras al Khaima. We have built a cement factory. We enjoyed good profits. And actually, Sheikh Saud wanted to sell this. And we have sold the cement factory. The investment was $15 million. Ras Rakia uh, got collected. 80 million dollars in four years so it's a fantastic investment i mean you invest 15 million dollars you get 80 more 83 million dollars net when you put it all together and there's your case and there's the georgians and then we have osama el amari and it seems to stem from this underlying fear of being perhaps overthrown i mean for you for instance if he's accused you or he believes that you're disloyal to him is he then worried that if he doesn't go after you, perhaps you'll disclose confidential information or he, he oh. won't kind of hit you hard to make sure you don't hit back at him or that you don't join opposition forces? Sheikh Saud should know I was probably the most loyal ever person to him in his life. And I am sure in the future he will never have somebody who has been as loyal as me to him. I never, uh, the, I never uh, betrayed him in any way and in any action. If he wanted to sell, I was doing everything for the interest to sell at the best price possible. If he wanted to construct, I was constructing with the best possible means to make a project successful. Well, I mean, it seems it's a, it's a classic purge, really. Anyone who had influence over Sheikh Saud, perhaps more than other people in his circle, wanted them to have you. You were a close friend. Other people had influence over him. And it seems that other people within his circle perhaps didn't want that to extend. So sure, sure, absolutely. Definitely in his circle and is his lawyers. Well, there, there were certainly issues, and other people have reported this to me as well, that there were issues when he appointed his son as his successor, and he wanted to disperse the influences from other sides, essentially, and take over. Well, oh. it, does, it does matter. Sorry to interrupt you. It doesn't matter. And actually, when Sheikh Saud has appointed his son, I told Sheikh Saud, I consider Muhammad as my son, and actually, he is the age of my children, and I am here to help him, assist him, and hand over to him. I am not here an enemy. I am I, I'm not looking for the power. I'm not looking for uh, image. I'm not looking for uh, influence. I am uh, I'm just a simple businessman. I created a ceramic factory out of which I benefited very well and I am very happy and it became the most the most prosperous factory of ceramics in the world. I could have groomed Muhammad taught Muhammad, handed over to Muhammad in a very nice and civilized way. Yeah, 
absolutely. So at what, what point did you get an inkling that something was changing, that you were potentially becoming a target? Because you left the country. Some people were jailed in, in this purge, as I describe it. Some people were jailed. Some people managed to leave the country in advance of being arrested, and they were later put on Interpol themselves. No, well, I, my, my contract with Rex, I did not have any other contract. I, I was, my revenue was with Rex Ceramics. I had a contract with Serac Ceramics until 30th April 2012. Right. I have done my job in Rack Ceramics until 30th of April 2012. My contract was not renewed and I did not ask to renew my contract because in Rakia I was withdrawn the power because they, he has appointed a board of directors who were following daily everything. And even in Rack Ceramics, Sheikh Mohammed, who was the chairman, he wanted to follow by himself everything. I was very happy with that. It doesn't matter. And in Rakin, he removed me as a chairman. Although the projects, they needed only one year to start all of them making money. And I told him one year, I need only one year. And this Rakin could make probably $100 million profit per year. And then I will hand over. Rakia, it was doing well. Actually, in 2010, 2011, Rakia made 300 million net profit. When my contract is finished in 30th of April, I stayed even to continue handing over slowly, slowly the businesses of Rakia. Rak Ceramics was taken by Sheikh Mohammed. I stayed. May, June, July in Ras Al Khaimah. And in June, I left for two, three weeks and I came back and I told Sheikh Saud I don't have anything anymore to do. I told him I am in, uh, I have a house in Lebanon. I will be in staying in my house. I want to rest a little bit and to see what I will do. So, and even Sheikh Saud was calling me in June, July, and in August, I came back. In August, there was a uh, uh, news on uh, in the, uh, on internet came that Qatar Massad has run away with his private jet with five billion five billion uh, dirhams or dollars in in his plane. So immediately when I heard the news, I, may, I immediately in August I came back to Ras Al Khaimah. I went to office of Rakia. I met the news uh, media people. I told them I am here. There is no, uh, I did not take any money and, uh, and, the, and the airport of Ras Al Khaimah is quite controlled and there is a police and there is customs and there is, and, and my plane cannot take 5 billion. I mean, 5 billion, you need a jumbo jet to take 5 billion. I went to Sheikh Saud, I said hello to him and I had lunch with him and everything. And he told me it's good to, that you came here so that uh, to, uh, uh, to deny all this and, uh, and I left. Okay, so you came back, you resolved all of that, and then you left again. Yes, yes. and, uh, and I, I left. And then in September, the assistant of Sheikh Saud, Sylvain Aid, called me to tell me that they have some problems in Dana Jet and in the airport because they have sold the aircrafts, out of which I used to own 50% of the aircraft, uh, the one aircraft. And uh, they have sold it to one guy, Murabit Sawaf from Jeddah. And this guy said there are problems. He told me, please, you come to solve the problems. Immediately the next day, it was 20th of September 2012. I went to Ras Al Khaimah. I went to the airport with the secretary assistant of Sheikh Saud to Murabit Sawaf. He asked me all the questions. I answered him everything. And then I went to Sheikh Saud to his house. He, uh, he took me for lunch. And he was upset with me, why you left me? I told him, I did not leave you. You have taken away everything from me, but I am here. He said, you have a lot of problems. I told him, I am here. If there is any problems, I am willing to solve. I'm willing to help. I will stay here. I will go to any country where are projects and problems. And I am willing to assist and help. And then he told me, you go to meet Jim Stewart. He has a lot of questions for you. I went to meet, it was a Friday. I went to meet Jim Stewart. And Jim Stewart, I stayed with him two hours. He asked me all the questions he wanted to ask about the projects in India, in uh, Indonesia, whatever it is. I answered him and he told me, thank you very much. I don't need anything from you. If I need, I will call you. I went back to Sheikh Saud. I told him I have met Jim and he was aware already. And I sat with him half an hour or one hour and then I left and the next day I went to Lebanon and that's it. And I started my own life. This is how it has happened. I, I, you know, I started my own uh, company at that time uh, to, to make industrial investments in ceramics because I thought I am still young to, to retire so early. I wanted to 
to make industry. And the only business I know very well is ceramics. So that's why I decided to make uh, ceramic investments, actually. And, uh, and I have uh, formed a holding company in Jersey, uh, Star Industrial Holding. And uh, many partners, they came in this company. And we have invested in Bangladesh in a ceramic factory. And we have invested in India. And we have invested in uh, Saudi Arabia. So, uh, and I used to travel via UAE to Bangladesh, to India, and to stop one day or two. And in 2013, I stopped and I canceled my residence visa, officially canceled my residence visa. I continued. In 2014, I went with my wife for four days holidays in Dubai. And we spent a long weekend and, uh, and that's it. And afterwards, in September 2016, I was arrested in Jeddah Airport. And you had no idea that that any warrants were issued against you or that he was... Absolutely out. nothing. I mean, basically, you'd been flying to the UAE, you'd got on with your life, you'd started your new ceramics investment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. and th things you'd left on good terms. Had you seen any of the other cases developing along the way? Were they reported in the media? No, no, no. I, I, never, I never thought... Uh, one one day one day uh, uh, this uh, uh, Farhad Azima asked me uh, that look Sheikh Saud want to find a settlement even he wants to pay you compensation and thinks please you meet Jamie Buchanan. Uh, I told him Deshert I don't want to meet Deshert if Deshert want to meet then I have to appoint a lawyer because a lawyer should not meet the client directly they should meet with the lawyers of the of the, uh, the other party. So he said, no, Jamie Buchanan is the CEO of uh, uh, the investment uh, office of Russell Khaima. And he, he wants to talk to you on a friendly basis. And this, please receive him, socialize with him, go for dinner with him and this. I told him, Farhad, no problem. If you say like this, I'm willing to meet him. I met him in Novotel, Bologna. And the meeting was at four o'clock. It took exactly five, 10 minutes. He told me, Sheikh Saud, he wants three things from you. An apology letter. I told him why. Apology letter for I have served him for 23 years and I made a lot of money for him. I have to give an apology letter for what? He said, you should know, you have to give an apology letter. Number two, you have to settle the projects. I told him, which project? You know. I told him, I don't know. You tell me which projects and what are the problems. He said, you should know. I don't know, you should know. I told him, okay. The third thing, he told me, you have to pay an amount of money. I told him, why should I pay an amount of money? You should pay money. I told him, how much you want me to pay? He said, I don't know, you decide. You have to pay an amount of money. So these are the three things Sheikh Saud want from you. I told him, sorry, first of all, I don't have money. I have invested my money. Number two, I cannot apologize. To the contrary, I wanted a letter from Sheikh Saud thanking me for the services I have rendered. And if there are projects, problem with any of the projects, and I can help because now in 2015, it is four years after they have taken over the business. So I don't know what they have done in between. The people who have taken over after me, I don't know what they have done. So if I can help, I will still help. Thank you very much. Bye bye. And I left. And afterwards, I continued my life. And this is what has happened. And so this this meeting with Jamie, when did that take place? On 30th September 2015. Uh, I met up with Jamie myself and a gentleman from Deckett Lawyers in London. And uh, he was more interested at that point in Osama El Amari, actually. But it was the same kind of thing. Whenever he meets up with, with someone who he deems is an adversary or that he wants to get money from he makes these gray area suggestions like you've done something wrong oh what is it please tell me yeah exactly and this is the same this is what he was doing in prison with the uh, jihads and um and karam. exactly so exactly what, what do you know about um uh, jihad and karam just while we're here were they contacts of yours or no, no. I, I actually, I don't. I, frankly speaking, after I left UAE, when I went back to UAE, Karam invited me for dinner, only one dinner, and that's it. But I don't have any dealings before, after, 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 after 2012, after I left Rakia. I did not meet Karam. I met him only once, and uh, and that's all. But nothing. I don't know anything, and I don't know what has happened. I don't know what they said, but I know that uh, they made confessions, confessions from Karam against me, uh, which is uh, not natural and not normal.
Well, Karam, as you know, has already sued uh, Deckard in the UK yeah. for those very, very uh, same forced confessions against you. Against yeah, they, they promised him to release him and to give him his money if he made confessions against me. Yes, and uh, the other one was I had a, an Indian man named uh, Johnson George. Now, he was a lawyer working in Osama al Amari's office. I don't know him. So he, again, it was the same thing. They were trying to force him to confess against Osama al Amari and disclose bank details of which he has absolutely no knowledge of. I mean, did it shock you? Like, I mean, you were arrested in Saudi. That, that's obviously shock number one. What, tell, tell us about that first, anyway. I was leaving Jeddah airport and the immigration, they told me, uh, you, I'm sorry, you have arrest warrant against you. I told them for how. The, it was in the evening. They kept me uh, in the police until morning. In the morning, they have taken me to the prosecutor office. And the prosecutor office, he told me, you have to sign here because we have to extradite you to Ras al Khaimah. I told him, sorry, I don't sign and I don't want to be extradited to Ras al Khaimah. He said, how? I told him, because I don't know why you should extradite me. I never knew that there is a case against me in Ras al Khaimah. I, never, I was never called. I was never defended. I was never, uh, I did not know. I was never informed there is a case against me in Ras al Khaimah. So I am sorry, I don't accept. I want to have a lawyer. I, first of all, and I, by which... Uh, treaty or by which uh, agreement you uh, you want to extradite me he said because they are asking i told him if they are asking it must be by treaty if it is riyadh treaty it doesn't apply to me if gcc treaty it doesn't apply to me i am a swiss investor in saudi arabia and i have uh, I, it doesn't apply to me to extradite me the, or you can judge me in saudi arabia or anywhere else but don't send me to Rasul al so the guy he laughed and he said okay uh, then I, I will uh, keep you here until we ask the file of the case and then we study and we will decide if it, is, uh, if it applies or not. I told him, fair enough, I will accept. He said, but I have to keep you in jail. I told him, I stay in jail. So he kept me in jail and it was Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock in the morning. I went to jail and then they asked for the files from Rasul Khaimah. The files came so quickly on Friday afternoon, they called me to the prosecutor office to tell me, here's the case of Russell Heimer. So at that time, I had organized with the Swiss embassy a lawyer. I went and I saw the case and it was a shock of my life because the case is that I jeopardized and I embezzled the money of the government of Russell Heimer because I leased the land to Mr. Jihad Kuzmar. Yes at a rate of 3.5 or 3.2 dirhams instead of 14 dirhams. It's true, I lease the land for him. But at that particular place, we were leasing the land between one dirham to five dirhams only. We never leased more than five dirhams. I don't know from where they put 14 dirhams, even till today, they are not leasing at 14 dirhams. They are leasing at seven dirhams. Yeah. Okay, so at that time, so my, the drama is, imagine, 5,000 square meters in 2007, okay? 2007 until 2012 is five years. 5,000 square meters. Suppose I would, should have leased at five dirhams to Jihad. It would have been a difference of two dirhams. Two dirhams times 5,000 square meters is 10,000 dirhams. 10,000 dirhams times five years is 50,000 dirhams. $13,000. The judgment is, the sentence is 23 years in jail. In any country, any jurisdiction in the world, would you see this? No. No. I mean, e even if he had a claim, and even if it were true and it could be proven, you would take that through the civil courts. You wouldn't take that as a, as a Thank you. action. And you Thank simply you. Put Thank put someone you. on Interpol and try to extradite them. It's, a, you know, Interpol, and we've seen this with Sheikh Saad so much, is just used by him as a tool of sort of punishment. So I think that's part of it. He must be enjoying having people locked up in foreign jurisdictions. We've had Sheikh Saad responsible for Italy, for Saudi, uh, and several other countries where people have just been held and eventually released, but they still, they still go through a lot during that time. And I think you were lucky that you were only held in Saudi for a, how, how long <laughs> Yes, definitely. I was lucky to be uh, to have been uh, arrested in Saudi Arabia. Yes.
<laughs> and who, who would think that we'd be saying that? Lucky to have been arrested in Saudi Arabia. After three weeks, I was released from jail and I went back to my office and to start working in the company. I was released on 16 October. On 5th of November, I was called by the prosecutor in Jeddah again to tell me there are five cases against you came from Ras al Khaima. They made five cases on 31st October, a judgment four times in one day. They have made a judgment against me more than 80 years in jail. They made a judgment and they sent it to Saudis to impress them to say that this guy is, uh, you know, he's a real big criminal, embezzled. And, and actually, when I was arrested, it was very much orchestrated because when I was arrested on 20th of September, they, the next day, on 21st of September, they have made a press release. Qatar Massad, the biggest crook in the world, he was arrested in Saudi Arabia. He has stolen $5 billion and this press release. To, I, it was to excite and to, uh, uh, to the Saudi authorities to uh, impress them in order to quickly extradite me. So, but, but I have explained everything and the people, they were very wise here to, be, to, to say the truth and they did not take it uh, for granted. I, again, the prosecutor called me. I answered them for two hours case by case. I explained my, my side of the story and left. They, again, they told me, thank you, you, you can go. I went and I continued my life. After six months, Saudi Arabia, I think, informed UAE that they are not going to extradite me. What they have done, that they have come to Saudi Arabia, to the jurisdiction of Rabig, where the factory is, yeah. and they went to the court there to, to raise two cases against me. One case to ask me $120 million that I, I have stolen $120 million, which I have sent to India. And one case is to block my assets, to confiscate my assets in Saudi Arabia. Right. Okay, this it was in uh, August 2017, September 2017. I was called by the court and uh, well, I have, uh, I have my lawyer here. I explained to him the story. The story which they came that I have invested in India against and without the knowledge of Sheikh Saud and without the knowledge agreement of the government of Ras al-Khaimah, I have invest, I wanted to invest, but actually I transferred $120 million to a project called Vampik in Hyderabad. And actually there was a project in Hyderabad and the project is still on. It is uh, Mr. Prasad came from India through Mr. Jagannathan, who was the CEO of Amar and uh, he was very well known to Sheikh Saud. Uh, when they came to me to tell me that there's a fantastic project to make a port industrial zone like Jabal Ali and an airport and uh, to uh, warehouses and things like that. And this project can make, uh, can make five times the investment in five years. So I took them to Sheikh Saud and they made the presentation of the project and Sheikh Saud said, go ahead. So we have, it is, True, Rakia has invested. We formed two companies, Rak Vision and Rak Infra in Mauritius, belonging to Rak Investment Authority. And we have transferred this money to these two companies. And these two companies have transferred the money to India, to the project of India, which is Vampik project in India. And all this documented and proper uh, papers, and it is in the balance sheet and the financial audited financials of Rakia since 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. And the money is there in the project. The, the, the Prasad, who is the chairman and the partner of Rakia in India, he had bought 53 million square meters of land. 53 million square meters of land at an average price of $12, you can imagine how much it is. We are talking about seven, eight hundred million dollars. Today, they own 25% of this, which they own actually $180 million on Rakia in India.
In 2010, Sheikh Saud said, I don't want any more, please, because I, I want to bring back the investment. We want to bring back the money. I want to develop Ras al -Khaimah. I don't want any more. I went to Prasad in 2010, and I told Prasad, Sheikh Saud doesn't want any more this project to continue. Uh, please, can you find a way to give us back the money? He said, look, I don't have any more money because I've, I have bought the land, but I have... Uh, uh, $15 million. I will transfer now back immediately $15 million to Rakia, which he has transferred. Prasad has given them properties in Dubai worth $35 million. He has given to Rakia, which means they have already recuperated $50 million. Right. The balance in India is $70 million and they are still owners of the project 25% in which they own 53 million square meters of land. So they came to ask me to tell the court in Rabiv that Khatir Masad has stolen with Prasad $120 million. He has to pay us $120 million. By which miracle, I, by which logic, by which law, by which conscious, you can do something like this. I mean, we, we have... Decat, Decat Law Firm, who have now been accused of not only the human rights violations, forced confessions and, and participating in torture, but we have them actively assisting in the fabrication of evidence against, you know, uh, a whole range of foreign nationals, Americans, British, all sorts of people. And I'd say in this case, I mean, that they have to be participating in it. I don't think they could deny liability in this. They said that we did not know that he invests without approval, without anything. So initially, the court said, it's not our jurisdiction. They insisted, they said, it's not our jurisdiction. They sent it to Jeddah. They went, they have taken, Ras al Khaimah has taken the case to Jeddah court. Jeddah court, they said, no, it's not our jurisdiction. Then they have appealed. And then in the appeal, they have instructed the court of Rabir to, uh, to judge. So when there was the judgment, and this was taken place in 2020, March, April 2020. In 2020, I told my lawyer, I don't want, uh, we, we want to, uh, to, to go ahead and uh, we will defend ourselves because there is nothing. I did not steal anything. If they can prove that I have taken any dollar, if they have proved that I have taken any dollar from this deal, I am willing to cut my head in front of you. Okay, and I allow them to take all what I own if I have taken a dollar. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, one, and I say it solemnly, and I wish Sheikh Saud would listen to this. So the story is that uh, we have given the document in the balance sheet, audited balance sheet of Rakia, it is mentioned the investment in Rak Infra and Rak Vision in India. It is mentioned the amount of $120 million. It is mentioned Sheikh Saud had written a letter to the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh telling him we have invested and this is government to government investment and please help us in the project. He has given a letter, I showed them a letter from Sheikh Saud to the prime minister of India telling him we have a project in Andhra Pradesh, please support us in the project. How they did not know? They said in the, to the court, we did not know. I mean, if you did not know, would you send the letter to the Prime Minister of India telling him, please help us in the project? When we presented our documentation, the guys, uh, the, our, the, the judge told them, please, this is the, the, the document of uh, Kater Masad from my lawyer. You please, you have to give your uh, a statement next week. Next week, they came with a letter to the judge telling him, we want to stop the dispute with Kater Masad. My lawyer told them, I'm sorry, we don't want to stop the dispute because for two and a half years, three years, you are disturbing his life to tell that he has stolen $120 million and now you want to stop the dispute? It cannot be. No, we want you to judge, please, Mr. Judge. So the judge told them, no, I want to judge. Please, you give your, uh, your uh, statement next week. Next week, they did not come. The judge cancelled the case. The problem, if they would have come, he would have judged and they would have lost. So that they have done is they did not come. He had to cancel the case. Cancelling the case, they have gone to Ras al Khaimah to make the same case against me and Ras al Khaimah. 
I mean, excuse me, it is out of the, we it's are in another it's world. Absolutely outrageous. We are, are, mean, we, are we, are we, are we in a jungle? Uh, Rada, please tell me. I don't know where are we. I mean, the, the thing is, like, this is 21st century. century. Like, this is the UAE. This is the UAE, the modern country. The, the country which is uh, showing to the whole world how developed and how beautiful it is. This is what is happening? How come? It's incredible, isn't it? They take a case against you in Saudi and they don't want to present it there because they realize they've got no evidence. They want to withdraw it. They want to take it in their local jurisdiction. Yes. They pursued you in Saudi originally. It was them who brought the case to Saudi. It was them who put the Interpol notice up and tried to extradite you. And as soon as they feel, oh, perhaps it's not going to go their way, it's straight back to their courts. And they're just ramming it through. It takes them five minutes to type out a judgment in their favor. Thank you. It's, it's incredible. So with these judgments, though, and this is the real issue, I think, something that the UAE Abu Dhabi absolutely has to address. I mean, the United Kingdom has a reciprocal enforcement agreement with the UAE, which means judgments that occur in the UAE can be enforced potentially in the UK quite in a more expeditious way. And then we've got the courts in Ras al Khaimah where uh, Sheikh Saud, if he wants a judgment against someone, he clicks his fingers and two minutes later he's got one and it's straight on Interpol if it's a criminal case or otherwise it's in civil courts in, or you know, with international frozen assets and seizures. And this kind, of, uh, this kind of thing can't happen. How can we ever respect the jurisdiction of the UAE, the legal system of the UAE, if this is happening? And it's so blatant. It's right there for everyone to see. And what's being done about that? I mean, Abu Dhabi really needs to clean up that uh, wrestle uh, reputation. Absolutely, absolutely. They're, they're not going to be able to do any deals with foreign jurisdictions. They're not going to be uh, able to enforce their judgments abroad. It's a shame. It's a shame. It should not be accepted. It's, it's a shame. So he turns around, he withdraws his case from Saudi. He then opens it in his local courts. He gets a snap judgment, of course, in his favor. And send it to Interpol. He sends it to Interpol, but not only that, now he's gone after your assets and assets in that Bangladesh. you don't even have an interest in, in Bangladesh, with <laughs> the fabricated, forged allegations, these ridiculous judgments that no one could ever respect. And Bangladesh took these judgments and actually uh, made a judgment in absentia against you for the seizure or the the freezing of your assets there and assets that you don't even have an interest in. And then you found out about this, was it through a press release from the Bangladeshi government? It's just, it's not doing any good for him. I mean, he's gone after so many people and so many people who were loyal or would have helped him even after he came into power, no matter who they were working with before. These are people who could have offered their guidance, offered their That's what I'm saying. He could have utilized them for him. Yeah. Uh, instead, he's decided to go on a purge. I don't, I don't care whether it's his advisors recommending it, his son recommending yeah. it. At the end of the day, he is the ruler and it's his decision. And yeah, he, but the, the, he doesn't realize that at the end of the day. Do you think anybody will trust him or we will, who, who, who will work loyally to him in Ras al Khaimah? The people are, it is very known, I know what is happening. Uh, people are there to take their salary, nobody wants to move anything, they don't want to do anything, they don't want to create anything. This is what's happening. It's a pity that this has gone this way. Anyway, I wish we could have stayed friends forever because friendship is to stay and to last and it's a human relation friendship. It's a pity to just leave everything. If I am a friend, you can tell me as a friend, please, my friend, you have done this, that, uh, you please correct it. This is the way I expect from a wise uh, ruler. Now, I mean, there's been so much criticism in the press um, directly at Sheikh Saad, and that's in the United States with Samar al Amari, it's in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, there've been multiple litigations and we've certainly been very outspoken about these abuses. Um, it hasn't done very good for him. What, what's he been like when he's suffered this kind of criticism? I know that, um, I mean, we obviously we spoke about the uh, sexual assault case in America and the campaign against him. Now, he employed a series of PR agencies, I believe, to sort of protect and whitewash his reputation as he was 
getting into trouble somewhat and or getting slandered even in the, in the well i know all these uh, agencies and all these uh, uh, companies and uh, lo the lobbyists what they call it and so on frankly speaking all of them they made just money and uh, in in the end they don't give a <laughs> they don't give a care about uh, uh, his reputation or what is achievement i mean it seems that he's under quite a lot of pressure, but is also probably being advised that anything that, you know, you are criticised about, any litigations where we bring up human rights violations and, and this kind of thing can be sorted out with a good public relations campaign, but it's simply not the case. I mean, we look at all of this and there is no way that people want to invest in RAC. Anyone who's come across this information, and because it's, I mean, you, you're obviously a very prominent businessman and people respect your opinion when you're when you're making recommendations about where to invest or what places to avoid, people are going to respect that. And it's the same with these other uh, victims, I would call them, of Sheikh Salad. I mean, they were very prominent businessmen. They were all over the world. They were bringing in investment as well and really promoting the environment, yes. doing a great job. And then to have them turn around and say, this is the riskiest place for you to invest in almost the whole world. I mean, that's a serious problem for the for the emirate i think and it's a serious problem for the uae but the, it's actually the business cases and the the publication about the business cases that is the worst thing for them because people who are going to invest in or seriously live in a country or help build it up or you know in, in this case if they're going to live in rack and help shakes out they're going to be doing a lot of research before they commit to that and if they see an entire purge of people who have been jailed abroad, put on Interpol, had their assets seized or frozen. That's not a very inviting situation. It's so risky. I have a friend in Dubai. His name is Wahid Atallah. He was he was uh, uh, he was sales manager in uh, Nakhil and Amar. Right. After he left, he for I don't know how many years. After he left, Sheikh Mohammed has given him a gift. One hotel in Dubai as a gift. Nice. <laughs> I have worked 23 years, made billions. What is my gift? Is to be sent to Interpol notices every day. You know, since, since three months, they have sent seven notices to Interpol against me. Seven notices, wow. Yes, yes, every week, every week they make a judgment. As you say, you know, it's a printing machine, the, the courts of Russell Heimer. Gosh, seven notices. And what now Interpol is not laughing about the subject, you know. Last year they have received five notices. In 2017, one notice. In 2018, one notice. 2019, uh, five notices. And now seven notices. I mean, excuse me, uh, the Interpol, they have nothing to do but to receive notices from Russell Khaimah? Uh, actually, till now, thanks God, I, have, I was not put on any red notice. Oh, because the Interpol asked me to answer. And I answered every time all the cases. Oh, good. And you did that through Saudi? Were you in, informed through Saudi? And I was, no, no. I was informed uh, through my Swiss lawyer. Okay. So every time... And they, send, they are sending the same notices to Saudi. By the, by the way, now the Saudis are not anymore uh, taking into consideration. They are not calling me anymore. Brilliant. I mean, that's, that's where we want to be. But so... I mean, the next time you travel, you're not going to experience issues because Interpol's well aware of this abusive pattern. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Uh, you'd, you'd want to try that by going to a friendly country first. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, we'll go to Switzerland. Back to Switzerland, exactly. <laughs> Direct flight. What would you say to investors? What would you, your advice be to anyone considering doing business in Ras Al-Khaimah? Well, uh, today, you know, I would lie to you if I will tell them to go to Ras al -Khaimah. While for, for seven years I was running the world, running the world, so, uh, very often weekends, I very rarely spend weekends with my family to go to promote Ras al -Khaimah. As I told you, in London, in Paris, in Munich, in Frankfurt, in, uh, in Delhi, in Bombay, in, uh, in New York, and so on, to promote Ras al -Khaimah. And uh, this is what is a reward for me. And now, uh, what do you want me to tell to advise investors to go to Ras Khaimah? I would lie to myself. And what does it feel like to be an international fugitive? 
international i am not international <laughs> fugitive i tell you why you know why because my conscience is free i sleep in 15 seconds i never stolen any dollar i never embezzled anything to the contrary i am proud of what i have done i am proud the achievement i have done in rak ceramics in rakia in alhamra in rakin in every project i have done and uh, i have to be rewarded and i wish one day the UAE will recognize that I have done good job for them via Rasfim. Bravo, I agree with that. Now, if you, if you were in Ras al Khaimah, you realize that you would be in prison. You, you'd be in there with jihad and Karam al Sadak, who haven't, you know, also haven't committed any crimes. And uh, I mean, how does that feel? You'd, you'd be 80 years in prison there at Sheikh Saad's command over, <laughs> over nothing. What do you want me to tell you? You know. It's amazing to think that, though, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Had, yes. you, had you not left, just because your contract had come to a completion and you were moving on with other jobs, you'd probably still, you know, be visiting a lot and, and perhaps, uh -huh. you know, perhaps you could have been arrested in the UAE on this interval. <clears throat> I mean, you were lucky you just flew to Saudi instead of going via the UAE somewhere else. Yeah. Yes. When you, when you look at it that way, it's, it's mind blowing. Yeah think that you could actually be imprisoned for something like this it's just it's astonishing but um okay well i think i've got a lot of material there thank you very much thank you good to have a nice you. evening and have a nice weekend thank you yes you too thank you bye-bye now amazing hata masad has been through so much in in the past few years it's, it's amazing but what i find amazing is if he were in the uae he would be along with Karam al Sadek, lawyer, Johnson George, another lawyer, and Jihad Kuzma, another lawyer. Three lawyers who have been detained without charge, without reason, in the UAE. And they're being used as leverage, they're being used as um, evidence in cases. They're, you know, the, and they're the ones who are obviously taking the, the litigations against Sheikh Saud and his agents for these forced confessions. Now, if Hatta Massad had stayed in the UAE, there is no way that he would have his freedom now. He would be jailed for life like these other people or used as political pawns. Totally unacceptable situation. Now, um, we're keen to see what Switzerland has to say about this and how they're going to support um, Abu Dhabi essentially cleaning up this mess and stopping it from happening. The UAE as is could be at the forefront of legal development in the whole Gulf. It should be setting an example. It should not be allowing this. This is just a terrible situation and we uh, hope that Switzerland is going to put that kind of pressure on them and other countries too, but particularly Switzerland. Uh, Hassan Massad is a Swiss national and he should have that support from the government and the Swiss UAE Business Council should not be encouraging investment in the country while the situation is allowed to go on. If more and more Swiss nationals go to the UAE and invest their money, they could end up in prison, they could end up in Interpol, they could end up with their entire worldwide assets being frozen by an illegitimate legal system. And this kind of behavior absolutely has to stop. We cannot say it's okay. And every time we go to a party and we promote this Swiss UAE relations, we're encouraging that behavior. We have to, uh, Put, put a foot down, essentially, and say we can't really invite Swiss uh, investors into the country. In fact, we're going to issue a warning to Swiss investors that if they come here, this is how they might end up. So the Foreign Office has actually responded so far, and we're really hoping they get involved. But uh, thanks to Hatta Massad for being on the Gulf Injustice podcast today. And we'll be speaking to him again shortly with updates, as well as Osama al -Amari and other people who have been victimized by the Ras al Khaimah Sheikh Saud regime. Thanks, I'm Radha Sterling. Thank you for listening to the Gulf Injustice podcast.